right, so in looking at the CIA triad, how does that fit in with information security governance? Well, that's where the ultimate responsibility of senior management comes in. So when we do talk about information security governance, it's all the total responsibilities, the practices, the policies that are set out by the board and senior management for which they will ultimately be held accountable for the CIA, the confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And I know that we talked about access control in the IAAA, and we'll talk more about that later, and that's an important idea, but really when we talk about the fundamentals of security, it's the CIA triad, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And governance needs to specify our broad goals as well as our objectives that will help us meet those goals. We already, you know, again talked about the SMART goals, so you'll see they should be specific. We should have metrics so that we can measure whether or not we're being successful. Um, one of the things that we'll talk about in the very next chapter is risk management. Everything that we do is going to be based on risk. And risk is going to help us understand what the potential for loss is so that we can balance that up with the cost of a countermeasure and make good, responsible uh, decisions based on security governance. And again, because we're looking at a cost-benefit analysis, that's going to make sure that we use our resources appropriately as well. Now, this last bullet point is so very important. We have to have an in-depth understanding of the value of an organization's information. How much is it worth? And let me tell you, the value of that information comes from so many different areas. For instance, um, do we have a legal responsibility to protect that information? So is it PII, uh, uh, personally identifiable information? Is it health information? Is it financial information? Uh, is it uh, information that's critical to the success of our organization? Uh, would the compromise of this information put human lives at stake? Uh, is there intellectual property? Does that property have value to my customers? So the value of information comes from a lot of different directions and sometimes that's very hard to quantitatively identify, right? To give a numeric value for. So we do have to have a good understanding of the value of what we're protecting because ultimately uh, we're not going to spend more money than what we're protecting is worth, but we certainly want to make sure that we spend enough money to adequately, adequately secure uh, our information. Now from there, um, just going back and re-emphasizing, because it's so important for a Chief Information Security Officer to really understand why we need that executive level role dealing with security. So if we look at this first sentence, governing security means viewing adequate security as non-negotiable. It's a requirement of being in business. And you know, as an information security professional, that's just a given to me. If you don't protect your information, you're going to be out of business. But you would be amazed at how many organizations look at information information security as a necessary evil. And when I say a necessary evil, it's only necessary when um, it's required by law or it's only necessary when the board members dictate it. And it's one of those things we've got to go through. Um, but if you have anybody in executive leadership that is not on board with the security function, then the company culture, the company's architecture, the company's strategy is going to suffer for it. And we're going to wind up failing to, pro to um, proactively protect our assets. Then we're going to have a security compromise. And then all of that. And then finally, my guess would be those executives are now going to be on board with security after suffering a tremendous loss. Let's avoid that and let's go ahead and be practical. Let's be proactive in our approach to security. All right, so this, this Chief Information Security Officer, we've talked about the CIA triad. Well, it's the CISO who's responsible for assessing the risks associated with CIO and uh, creating the policies designed to, uh, I may have said CIO, so assessing the risks with CIA and then developing and implementing policies that will protect confidentiality, integrity, and availability.
Uh, they also serve kind of as a go-between because they work with the other elements within senior management, chief executive officer, chief operations officer, chief financial officer. All of those folks are very important in providing security for the organization. So I'm constantly as a CISO working with each of those other officers and sometimes I'm playing you know the game of selling security to them but ultimately is about managing risks and understanding what those risks are. So that's my job. I'm going to establish those policies or certainly make my recommendations for policies. I'm going to make sure that they're measurements and that we have an auditing mechanism in place so that we can determine if the policies and procedures are working and if they're being followed and find out any issues of non-compliance. I also would stress that part of my role as well and a very significant part of my role is to make sure we maintain compliance and there are numerous regulations and, and legislation uh, pieces that are out there that really dictate how we have to protect our information whether it's um, health information, personally identifiable information, financial information, uh, whatever that may be we have to look to uh, the industry regulations and make sure that we're in compliance. That's my job as a CISO as well. And then of course making sure that I'm aware of emerging threats. If my organization is prepared for the threats of today we're already a step behind because attackers are very forward thinking. As soon as one mechanism has been secured, they're looking to find another vulnerability that they can exploit. So I have to be very knowledgeable and well versed in emerging trends within the security fields as well. So a lot of responsibilities go to the CISO. Now there are other roles within the organization I'll be familiar with. You know, we talked about the CEO, the chief executive officer. Well, they're the individual that has, or that's the individual that has the ultimate say uh, on implementations within the organization. And if we're talking about selling security, uh, the CEO has to be on board, of course. Now the chief financial officer signs the checks. So this is someone that you want in your corner and this is someone that you want to understand and especially the need for talking in terms of risk management rather than throwing a whole lot of terminology and acronyms and, and cyber verbiage at them we really have to just break it down and speak in terms of loss potential and cost of mitigating strategies. Okay. Um, I, it's not here. There's a, some organizations have a separate chief information officer um, making sure that there's an alignment between technologies. A lot of times that gets rolled up or the CISO's rolled up in the CIO role. Sometimes they're separate and sometimes not. And then I, I didn't mention on this slide, but the chief operating officer, of course, that oversees the ultimate operations of the organization. Ultimately, when we look at having um, security audits, and a security team that's designed for the purpose of audit, they actually wind up answering to the chief operating officer uh, rather than answering necessarily to the information security officer. Because as a CISO, my job is to develop the plans and, and make sure uh, that they're implemented, but the auditing team is going to make sure that I've done my job well. So obviously they wouldn't be answering to me. Other uh, roles and responsibilities within the organization, the steering committee, usually uh, this is uh, a specific group. A lot of times you have steering committees directed towards solving a specific problem. So you look at a steering committee that's going to assess the possibility of opening a branch office in another location something like that. Um, auditors evaluate business processes, of course, we've talked about them. Uh, and remember, auditors audit. Auditors don't fix problems, they document problems. And we return that to senior management to determine uh, a means of correcting the problems they've found. All right, two additional roles here, data owners and data custodians. So when we talk about the owner of the data, these are the folks that determine uh, the classification of the data. They determine the value of the data. They determine who should access the data. So it's their data. Essentially, all those elements mean they're the ones that evaluate the data. Okay. Then it's the data custodian who's responsible for enforcing the security. So whereas the data custodian may say this should be classified as secret, 
uh, I'm sorry, the data owner would say this should be classified as secret. It's the custodian that implements the security controls that enforce that classification. They're also responsible for backing up and being able to restore data. A lot of times the custodian is a function of the IT department or the IS department. Okay, and then the final two roles, network administrator and security administrator. Um, in many smaller organizations, the same individuals satisfy both these roles. But that really is a problem from a realm of separation of duties. Because when we look at the network administrator, their specific function is availability, to make network resources available. Now, the security administrator should be looking to satisfy the security requirements first and foremost. So there's a little bit of a conflict of interest. But again, don't forget, security administrators are there to make sure that security policies are being followed. We're going to see audit as part of the security team. We want to make sure that someone's evaluating what the network administrator does. So those two should really very much be separate roles.